All right, let's break this down a little bit so we have a better understanding about the motive here. And joining me, although she's not on set, we have her via Skype. So happy to have her, criminal defense attorney Marnie Jo Snyder. Marnie Jo, great to have you back here on Long Crime. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay, I want to talk to you about this. So we've seen witnesses being put forward by the prosecution to show at the very least that you don't want to be in business with the defendant, that this is a guy who doesn't really, you know, uh, honor his obligations, that he seems to be a little fluid with money, and then also he has been shadily, perhaps, embezzling funds from the mixed day business. Is this enough, though, to show motive? I mean, it, it's enough to show some sort of motive, um, especially if he thinks he's going to get in legal trouble, uh, maybe criminal charges or something like that for the embezzling funds. Um, but someone, sometimes the people that act like this um, think that they are Teflon coated, right? No, nothing's going to stick to them. But a criminal embezzlement charge is a big deal. That's enough of a motive um, to want Mr. McStay to no longer be here and, and be able to move against him. There are some people who say, though, how could you kill an entire family for, you know, oh, a few thousand dollars? Yes, it was maybe over $21,000 he wrote checks to himself out for. But the idea here of just killing a whole family for money? Did, what would you say to those people that have doubt about that? Right, well, that, that doubt is something that the defense really wants to nurture because it's true, it's just a few thousand dollars. Um, even a charge like that might have restitution if it goes criminally. Really, who has the bigger, better motive? Um, who's going to benefit more if this family is not here? Not just be protected and not have to pay something back, but who might benefit from it? So it is a really great idea for the defense to point to people um, who would have that bigger motive, that, that larger thing that might draw them in to feeling like they need to kill uh, Mr. McStay and any witnesses, no matter how, um, unfortunately, small or precious to them. Yeah, and we're looking at these photos, these videos of the family. I guess the other question is, who could actually do this? Who has the stomach to kill an entire family like this? And the argument's going to be the person with the big motive, the person that's on the end of their leash that has nowhere to go and that has that desperation, because you're right, it's a monstrous act. Um, and so that is the argument is this is a tiny motive. This doesn't make sense for something so incredibly horrific. And perhaps it's not fair for anybody to judge the, the position of the defendant because, you know, he was in, allegedly in gambling debt. He had this problem. $21,000 might not be a lot to other people, but for him, maybe it was a lot and could save him. So we're all still trying to understand what happens. The prosecution's building their case. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we have a lot more to analyze. And again, we expect to be live in that courtroom in less than an hour. So stay tuned here on Law and Crime. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking about the Charles Merritt trial, and when we last left off, we were playing in the testimony of Jeffrey Martin, who is a business associate of Joseph McStay, talking about that he got into some trouble with the defendant, and the defendant wouldn't even fulfill, fulfill his obligations, and that there was a chance that they were going to file a lawsuit to get the money back from the defendant. Let's see how he did under cross-examination by the defense attorney. It's addressed to somebody, correct? I think it's the name you just mentioned. Uh, yeah, Christina Martini. She's an interior, was an interior designer at the time, but she's no longer with us. Okay, but that would be the person that, that would have, at least based on your, your knowledge of how your company works, would have had the contact with Earth Inspired Products? Correct. Okay, and that person would have done, Ms. Martini would have done the, uh, I guess, the work related to getting this first initial invoice to your company, correct? Correct. All right. And so, do you know who she was in contact with at Earth Inspired Products? I don't. Were you aware that Mr. Merritt, the person that you were speaking with, and that was sometime later, correct? Correct. That he is not an employee of Earth Inspired Products? Objection assumes facts not in evidence. Objection sustains both for speculation by this witness. Do you know what Mr. Merritt's relationship was with Earth and Fire Products? Objection and speculation. Would it, would it have been after um, Ms. Heckerman, Susan Heckerman, would have contacted um, 
Earth-inspired products, or would it have been before? I, I'm sure that it was after Susan had conversations with Mr. Merrick and Earth-inspired, and it finally got to my desk as an ongoing issue. So usually the president's the last, last one to deal with the issue. Correct. Okay. So it was some time later, and your conversations with Mr. Merrick went something like Mr. Merrick telling you, hey, I haven't got any money on this. If you want me to build your waterfalls, you need to send me some money. Correct? Okay, Marty Joe, I want to ask you about Dan Cavanaugh. This is the other person who was forwarded by, um, flouted by the defense here as this alternative suspect. They're saying that financial motive really is the motive here, just not on the part of their client, Dan Cavanaugh, that he was cut out of a deal, he himself was in financial troubles, uh, and that he had a really bad relationship with the defendant. I'm curious your thoughts about him as a suspect. I mean, I, I can't speak to him as a suspect with everything, but what I can say is that that part of it seems extremely compelling to me. Um, you know, when someone is locked in a business relationship with someone, just the nature of being engaged in that relationship and unable to get out, or when a business partner is doing something toxic to the business and then being cut out of deals, I mean, that that's a really huge um, financial incentive, but it doesn't end with the dollar sign. It, it's kind of how you are stuck and trapped in your career for a while, and I think that that's really compelling. I'm actually surprised that these emails that have threatening things in them are not being allowed uh, to be presented to the jury. Oh, yeah, that was a surprise considering, I mean, but the judge had ruled that they seem too speculative, that they can introduce this I theory that Dan Cavanaugh might be a right. person of interest, but at the same point, you can't show only so much. Um, but this, again, this financial motive is not the only thing we saw in the courtroom this past week. We also saw the testimony of the medical examiner, and this testimony was key. Let's play it for you right now. Most of all the bones are white, rich, and dried and flaky. There's some brown discoloration on one of the ribs and top of the bones. And moving on to the actual next exhibit, which would be 351. Did you find anything significant about this particular part, portion of the skull that was remaining? On this front alone, we see a uh, circular or half a circle defect on the back right side. Um, the cause of this is unknown. There's also a uh, fracture or broken piece of bone here on the right side. And this fracture determined to be not very warm. Do you remember somebody by the name of Dan Kavanaugh? I didn't hear that name until uh, the mistake I we went missing. Do you remember the detectives asking you about that in your September 30th, 2014 interview? I do. Have you Okay, not exactly what we were looking for. We're trying to play some more of the medical examiner. And maybe, Marnie Joe, I can get a quick question from you. Uh, so, Marnie Joe, what the medical examiner basically testified to is it is not 100% definitive that these wounds, if they were sustained, inflicted by a sledgehammer, that they would have caused a tremendous amount of blood loss, which is interesting because one of the questions we keep asking is if these murders happened in the McStay family home, where's all the blood? Right. I mean, we. I think that what they uncovered was not something that seemed like a horrific crime scene, and these certainly were horrific murders. Uh, so it is very confusing, and they have to explain that to the jury. I mean, it's not exactly CSI effect, uh, where, and the way that we say that is that the jury is looking for scientific proof of who did it, where they did it, how they did it. Jury does at least want explanations, and they deserve them if they're going to be asked to find someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt yeah. of how this could have happened and to be able to visualize the crime in some respect. Speaking of explanations, let's get some more explanation from the medical examiner. Take a look. The top of the skull, again, you see the same half circle fracture here on the left side of bone, and the area that was dark in the other picture is actually this area, the left, left back side of the head also looks like a half circle. And you can tell that even though there are no bones in this area, that there was an impact here because of this piece of uh, skull. It's triangular shaped with a circular base that is broken but still attached to it. 
You also see another uh, fracture here on the sutures, which connects the two bones. And moving on to exhibit 353, can you tell us what's depicted in this photo? In this photo, you're looking at the left back side of the skull. You're getting more of a clearer look of the circular shaped fracture with the still attached broken bone. And moving on to exhibit 358, you can tell us what's depicted in that photo. So for orientation, you are now, the front of the skull is missing. You're looking at the top of the head and the base of the skull is here on the table. You see that same uh, curvilinear fracture here in the left parietal. But in this photograph, you see another fracture that has a curved line. This fracture resulted in the fracture in the suture. It also radiated outward towards the left side. And on the right parietal bone, you see an impact here causing a linear fracture coming up to the fracture on the top of the head. Well, there's one thing we can say for sure. It was a brutal attack and just a horrible crime. Marnie Joe, one of the things we also learned about being in the desert is the way that the bodies were different from one another. I mean, Joseph McStay appears to be the only person that was wrapped up in something and that he had this electrical cord wrapped around his neck. The fact that he was different than the other three victims, what does that tell you? Well, it, from... I can't say what it says from a forensic standpoint, but what it says from what the uh, prosecution and defense has to do is they have to show that this was where the concentration was, right? If they want their motive to be believed, it's a motive against Mr. McStay. And so it would follow that he would have either worse injuries or have been kind of a, a different type of target or subject of all of that force. And maybe the other people that were, were killed were really killed because they were witnesses. The motive didn't go to them anyway. Um, then, obviously, the defense can use the brutality of it to point to someone needing a much, much stronger motive than just a few thousand dollars if they're going to cause all this damage. And even if it's to Mr. McStay, right. they need more of a personal uh, vendetta. I mean, Marnie Joe, you basically said it. You, we're all looking at the same set of evidence and facts, and you can argue it in two separate ways. Luckily, it's not for us to decide. It's ultimately up for the <laughs> jury. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about this trial, which we will be live in. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Well, those are the words of the defendant himself and not something we always get to see. Let's get some perspective right now. Marty Joe, you've been listening to the defendant and his own words. And one of the interesting things to note, oh, oh I'm sorry, I don't think Marty Joe can hear me right now, so I think we need to work on that. Uh, while we work on that, maybe we can throw to another clip. Okay, let's throw a little bit more to uh, the defendant when in his police interrogation tape from 2010. I try not to think about that, actually. Um, Mikey and his mom keep saying you know, things, things like that, but, you know, I don't know of anybody that's hurt Joseph, or two little kids for that matter. So, do you have any knowledge or information which indicates to you that it is? I have no idea about it. You know, I'm not sure what what I uh, use past tense in, in, in context with, uh, but I have no idea why. Uh, Joe was my best friend. Okay, 
Okay, Marnie Joe, I think you're back with us. So let's talk more about this police interrogation tape. Some of the things that stood out for me were the idea that, yes, he was using the past tense when the family had just went missing, um, and the fact that he seemed a bit critical of Summer McStay and the boys. Not so much Joseph, but Summer and the boys. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I... I don't know. I think that that's not going to be the hardest thing ever for the defense to minimize. But we're talking about everything the jury hears. So that, you know, that along with other things, other parts of the motive could be really damning for him. I think that the defense needs to do a really great job of pointing out nuances in the interview. And it's a little bit hard for us to hear. But are the police using the past tense? Did they use the past tense when they were bringing him in and before they uh, started the recorder? Were other people in the community, were the rumors starting to fly more and more about them being deceased at this time, whereas the general public was actually using the past tense when they weren't being in interrogated? I think those things may need to be flushed out if, in the grand scheme of things, this does see seem really damning. But in a bubble, not the end of the world uh, for the defense. Well, it makes you think. It makes you think about a lot of things, and that's what we're trying to do, get some answers to what happened to this entire family. Let's take a break. When we come back, we have a more to analyze from the testimony from earlier in this trial. We'll be right back. Okay, let's break this down right now with criminal defense attorney Marnie Joe Snyder. Marnie Joe, you're back with us talking about this case. And Marnie, I got to ask you a question about this. This was something that stood yeah. out for me. If we're trying to look at his police interview and seeing if he's hiding something, the fact that he said that Joseph McStay doesn't really have enemies, that everyone seems to love him, and the fact that it doesn't seem likely that he would have gone to Mexico, why would he say that if he's the one who really killed this man and his family? Wouldn't it have been in his self-interest to say, yeah, you know what, I, I think he would have gone to Mexico, or he had a ton of different enemies? Yeah, I mean, he, he doesn't point to anyone else in uh, that interrogation, um, and he doesn't know he's being accused then. And so I think that that's really telling. What does he say, you know, before he is trying to get himself out of trouble, right? There's an indicia of reliability if he's in there just to talk. Um, he also says some some. He said something where I thought he said something about, like, I wasn't that impressed with her being Colombian. Oh, oh, oh. It had some racial uh, overtones. And I don't think he would have said something like that if he was trying to cover things up. So it is interesting how upfront he is. He's also upfront about his death and and um, the deceased death. So I don't know how much of that points to him being um, sophisticated or trying to hide things. Well, is that why he spoke with them and didn't have an attorney and lawyer up? because he felt he had nothing to hide? I don't know. I, I mean, a lot of people kind of think that way. You know, I didn't do anything wrong, so I'm going to speak without an attorney. But honestly, a lot of people who eventually plead guilty, admit to, that they're guilty um, or are guilty, also speak with police because they think that somehow they can give them something that is going to help them in court later on. It's just not smart to speak without an attorney. And I think people have all different kinds of strange motives for doing it. Uh, not a great idea. All right, we're waiting for the live feed, Marnie Joe. So I got to ask you, what do you expect for today? I, you know what? I can't tell. I, I have to say that I often, when we talk in bits and pieces about this case, I find myself siding with defense. Well, that's not the end of the world. That's not the end of the world. But really, the prosecution is putting together a circumstantial case, and they do have many, many pieces. Uh, so it, it's right. really hard to tell. I assume they're going to keep layering it on and layering it on today and telling us a little bit more each time and putting these puzzle pieces together. Yep, and that's what we're trying to do, too, trying to make sense of what this is all about. Marnie Joe, thank you. I know you're going to stick around. I'm going to be signing off. Vincent Hill will be signing on, and he's going to guide everyone through the next chapter of this trial out of California. So, everybody, stay tuned here on Law & Crime. We'll be right back. We have a lot to cover.
and then you come up with that. Oh, okay. That is funny. Part of that, the 15 more started while well exit. Okay. Uh, let's see, is it over by the landfill? Yes. It's within, I'd say, about a half mile of the landfill. It's directly to the south of me. Okay, so from the landfill, where are you? Um, due north, approximately, uh, I'd say a good uh, 2,000 feet. Okay. Did you, find, did you find it in the landfill or just in a field out there near it? In a field? Okay, so that was John Bluth. He actually discovered the bodies of the McStay family. Still with us, Marty Joe Snyder. Marty, I want to talk about the, the importance of this 911 call. And a lot of people don't realize how important 911 calls are. You heard he was giving directions. He was giving instructions. How many feet from this? How many feet from that? That, to me, is crucial evidence when cases go to court, when a person calls in and, and they give you those types of details. What say you? Right. Well, so they're going to backtrack the details that he gave because he's giving them at the same time he's discovering them with no motive to lie, no reason for this not to be reliable. And it becomes really important because if they're trying to find out what kind of truck, what kind of car, what kind of person's shoes took those bodies out that desert because they don't know when they've been dropped. They still need to do that, whether it was three years ago or that day. Um, that's really important. Is it that the evidence wasn't there for them to find? or if they found evidence would have pointed to someone else. So it's really the diligence of the police based on that information that can be attacked by the defense or bolstered by the prosecution. Yeah, absolutely, and you made a good point. He's calling it in as he sees it. He has right. no reason to lie in this case because he doesn't know who these individuals right. are in these shallow graves. He probably didn't even know of the McStay family because the case had been cold essentially for three years and investigators, keep in mind, believe the family was in Mexico. So I think this 911 call is crucial to this case uh, as far as where the bodies were discovered. You can see the McStay family, Joseph and his two sons there on your screen. I think this 911 call is, is very crucial uh, here in this case. We're going to take a quick break again. We're waiting for that courtroom in California to go live. As soon as it does, we'll bring you live testimony. Stay tuned right here on the Law and Crime Network. Okay, again, you're listening to testimony from Elva Fonseca. She is a former employee of Charles Marriott. Still with me, Marty Joe Snyder. Marty, I know your time with us is coming to an end, but I do want to talk about, we heard the, the talk here about these invoices uh, between Merritt and McStay. And, of course, the prosecution says that this entire case boils down to money. So, of course, we would want to call this witness to the stand to talk about those invoices. But do you think that it could have any bearing on this case? I, I can't tell yet. I mean, so they want, they definitely want to establish, if they can, who had access to the QuickBooks by permission, who would have had to be doing something more nefarious to access it, um, What and, and in that, what was their habit of doing so, what was their normal operating procedure. But I don't know that it speaks to how something can change, you know, or how you might ask an employee to act on just a particular day or what their agreement was uh, at this point. I mean, there is some indication that they're calling each other a lot, uh, meaning Mr. McStay and Mr. Merritt uh, right before Mr. McStay goes missing. It, it could be that that was because there was something really pressing right. in regards to business, something not nefarious. And all of a sudden he's using the QuickBook. So I can't tell how this is gonna play out at all, but that's the thing. The prosecution is gonna keep connecting the dots right. as best as they can for us. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, Marty. I mean, we don't know what the agreement was, nor can we expect that right. this uh, Elva Francesca would even know. Marty, Joe, I know your time is up. I appreciate you joining us. We're going to take a quick break. Have so much more to come in the Charles Merritt case. Again, he's on trial right now in the state of California for the murder of the entire McStay family. Four people killed in California back in 2010. Stay tuned to the Law and Crime Network. You don't want to miss it. We have so much more to come. We'll be right back.